morning. Today we are going to talk to Dr. Chris Foster from the Department of Drama and Theatre Arts. Welcome Dr. Chris. Thank you very much. Dr. Chris, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Yeah, that's an interesting story. I, uh, I only started at the university in 2015. So before that I worked in the entertainment industry for, for millennia. So um, when I got here, I was appointed as a, a lecturer researcher. So that was the first time that I was actually confronted with the word researcher. So, um, and then they said that if I want to keep working here, I need to get a PhD and I need to do research and all those things because I just thought I'm just going to teach students. So that's really the first time that I started seriously doing research. I did that obviously when I did my master's in the 90s, but who can remember what happened in the 90s? That's too long ago. Um, and then I had to basically learn from scratch again because the world's changed so much. And uh, just in terms of research, when I did it in the 90s, obviously we worked with books and, and the internet was really just kind of get you know, it was just starting off, but now uh, just doing research and the luxury of having everything at your fingertips is fantastic. So yeah, um, that's how I started and then I really developed quite a love for it. Thank you so much, Doctor. And then what are you currently working on? Currently, I'm, I'm just finishing off uh, a book on the actor Marius Baez, a, a biography. Uh, I, I started that last year while I was actually finishing up a, a, a previous study on, on the television producer Franz Marx, the guy who started Egoli. So when I uh, started with that research, it kind of also started developing into the next one. So, so that's what happens is as you read one thing, then you see, oh my goodness, there's something that I need to research further in this field. So uh, the second study almost developed from, from the first study. So I'm finishing off that, the book now. It's, it's, it's um, they're printed in, in September. And I've already kind of started thinking about new things, also in that line, because I'm kind of busy with, with bio biographies and historical writing and things like that. Um, I saw one of the questions you guys had was, is there a gap in, in the field? And there's definitely, in terms of television writers and people working in television, there's not a lot of writing about that in terms of their uh, creative methodology, just the way they constructed their stories. So that is a field that I'm still exploring and I'm, I'm talking to a lot of writers in the industry, active writers who are, who are still working in the television industry, to document the way they work, because there's nothing about that. Thank you so much. And then, coming to writing, is there any specific uh, philosophy or perspective that influence your writing? Oh. Well, it depends on what writing you are talking about, of course, because uh, in my world there's there's two specific. It's it's the fictional writing on the one hand, plays that I write, or um, I'm, I'm considering writing a fictional book now as well. That's the one side, and obviously um, academic writing. With the books, it's a bit better because you kind of can combine um, the pleasure and humor you have with fictional writing with um, historical writing, so combining it, but in terms of a philosophy of writing, I absolutely believe in writing from my world and my experiences. Um, I, I, I feel that and I, and I encourage students when they are writing plays for me or, or little screenplays is to work from your heart, your world, or your knowledge, your emotions. Don't don't try to pull in the world's ideology and what everybody's thinking at this stage and what's going to be fashion and uh, what would other people like because inevitably that's going to be 
um, that's not really going to come from your heart and from your experience. So for me, myself, even as an old man, I, there's still things I don't know about, so I'm not going to write about it, and I'm definitely not going to have my, my writing be influenced by whatever's going on in the world, because as we know, the world changes its mind the whole time. You don't know it. So, um, yeah, no, I, I would say if, if, if you have to simplify it, it's just about being very, very honest in terms of what you feel the world needs and what you need. Okay, thank you. And then coming back to the artificial intelligence. Oh. What role can it play in drama and theater arts? No role. <laughs> <laughs> I will not cast artificial intelligence. No. No, we had a, a very nice discussion before we started here as well. I do not think at this stage that AI can really write creatively. I also don't believe that it can be funny and write humor and uh, real human emotions. Yeah. I do think it's quite a nightmare in terms of academic writing because a lot of AI can can influence students to think that they can actually write academically. The problem is that if you don't, you can use artificial intelligence for uh, initiating a project or sometimes even finding sources because a lot of times it's difficult to find who wrote about a certain subject. So there, there's definitely a use for it. In drama and theater arts and in, in television, film, that at this stage will not work because you might use AI as part of your research. If I'm, say, writing a, about a certain subject or about a certain character or something and I need to do some research, then AI would definitely help me there too. But then again, I need to now sit and then create that. Um, AI, I know for a fact that a lot of directors would say they would love the day that we don't have to work with real actors because real actors are full of, <laughs> they, they give you a lot of uh, drama, literally and figuratively. So, um, but at this stage, uh, I, I think in terms of writing, it's a nice starting point, but it won't be able to write creatively yet. So, looking at uh, TikTok. Mm. What, what role can it play? Interestingly enough, what, what TikTok did um, is, uh, it, it, it's a quite a, a compact way of telling a little story, which is in our world, and especially in film, it's a good way of teaching students to not have anything in the story that is not absolutely essential to the narrative. So these little short narratives that people created in TikTok is, is actually quite a nice way of saying, well, you know, uh, it has impact even if it's only 30 seconds long or... Uh, but I'm no, I have no um, knowledge about the workings of TikTok and, and social... In fact, I don't do any social media to hold my fingers up to, to think. But the, um, I think, again, like with AI, you can use certain aspects of something like TikTok, for instance, to inspire and get creative or even just get an idea from it and then develop that idea. I, I, I try to teach the students to use anything you get, um, any reading you do, any visual um, impetus, use all of those things to create new stories. So then you can use TikTok as well. Thank you so much. And then are there any gaps within your field of study? Yes, I, I think definitely uh, within what I'm doing at this stage, just the fact that nobody's written about, like I said earlier, about South African television writers specifically, but also the archives. Um, a lot of this stuff stopped working as certain institutions started to kind of almost dissolve Obviously, the archiving also stopped, and um, or it's not quite um, on the standard it should be. So, I feel also that if you do research and you you gather all of that information, then at least all of that information is in one place. Like for instance, now that the, the biography on on um, 
Marius Weyers, a lot of the information he had in his, literally in boxes in his house, nobody knows about that information. So at least I took over a thousand articles, uh, you know, papers and, and, and um, magazines and things, and now all of those things are archived. It's actually somewhere that you can access those things. And then I'm going to take it to Nullen and they're going to actually have it in their archives. So the gap for me in terms of historical writing in South Africa, there's definitely places where we still need to get information and put those in archives so that future generations can get access to it. Thank you so much. Uh, Doctor, I've noticed that you have directed more than 600 episodes. Oh, we yeah, are with, uh, with uh, soap opera. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Which one would you say stood up for you? In terms of, of episodes? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, when you work in soap operas, I, I did that for 15 years, and obviously every day you do a whole episode. So what I did was I also acted sometimes in it. Sometimes I even acted in the episodes that I directed as well. I would say the the thing that I enjoyed the most was definitely the big scenes, like um, the weddings or the big party scenes, or because it's just so incredibly challenging to direct 10, 12, 15 people and give everybody a chance to do their dialogue on a specific camera. Um, so I, I kind of missed that a bit, because that really, <laughs> uh, that's hard work. Okay. And then, I think it was in 2019, where you were a leading actor mm. in a TV show that displayed. Yeah, it displays, yeah. Yes. Yeah, can, yeah. Can, can you just share with us? That was a fascinating project, yeah. Um, I, it was, that's a one wonderful thing working with the university is I, I could actually do that work as well. Um, although, uh, I told them I'll, I'll do the show, but then we need to shoot it over December and January. So they rescheduled the whole thing, which was wonderful. So I could then put in leave at the university, shoot it in December and January and, um, uh, what was wonderful about that was um, just we had about, I would say, of that time, six weeks of that we shot at, at night. We, we started um, shooting at 6 o'clock in the evening until 6 o'clock the next morning. So, because the whole show was, most of it was uh, during the night. So I developed this weird, almost vampire world, you know, we, you sleep during the day and you work during the night, which was very, very fascinating. It took me so long to get back to, to normality. Um, that is also something that I would love to do uh, eventually again is, is maybe, because what is very nice about it is I wrote down every day all of this new stuff that I learned. Even as an old man, I could still learn because there's a new generation of filmmakers. So I wrote all of those things down and I brought all of that stuff back, a journal, and I shared that with the students as well because wherever you go, no matter how much experience you have, you always there's always something to learn, uh, even if it's, you know, how not to do stuff. So I wrote down all of that stuff and I brought that back and it was actually a very, very nice um, source of information, new information that I didn't know. Yeah. Wow, that's great. And then, in your opinion, how can drama and theatre arts advance social justice? Oh my goodness, we, we've been doing that forever. That, that's our purpose. <laughs> Um, especially theater. Theater itself has always been totally part of the human psyche. So whatever happens with people and especially social justice and, and, and injustices, all of, uh, racism, anything that, that had to be, that, that society kind of felt, hey, we have to talk about this stuff. Now, even if we go back to the Greeks, they couldn't politically talk about certain things, so they had the comedies. So satire came from the fact that I'm not allowed to say something, but I'm kind of saying it. So uh, within our world, that is almost 
the the driving force, the, the, the main part of our narrative is to talk about things that the world needs to address. And and what what is lovely is um, that in, in drama you can disguise things so that people don't know that you're actually telling them, hey, 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 <laughs> get yeah. your act together. Yes. So they're laughing and they're enjoying it, but when they go home, they go, hey, what did they tell me? No, so, so no. Uh, um, and I, obviously, with, with, there's always a balance. You, you don't want to be too forceful with it. There's still a balance in terms of it has to be entertaining. And, 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 and in fact, I, a lot of times I tell the students where film and television kind of leans more towards the entertainment part, the theater would always have a responsibility to talk about what's happening in our world and, and between our people and, and, and in South Africa and South African real, real, real issues, um, social justice, etc. cetera. Um, but again, never to force it so much that people go, you know, please, it's enough. Uh, but no, that's our responsibility. We have to do it. Thanks a lot. And then, Doctor, what message can you say to aspiring researchers? <laughs> Get a good chair. <laughs> and Because you sit a lot. You sit a lot and you, um, you read a lot. I got advice quite early when I started doing research uh, from a lot of the professors and people saying, do something you really have an, a passion for. Because you spend so much time with that subject. Um, I, I told somebody, it's almost as if you're in a relationship with, well, with whatever you are re uh, um, researching. At. So with this book now, that, that, that the last one I, I wrote, I actually have a relationship with, I, I, I have a commitment to every day visiting, every day and, and you have to absolutely have a passion for it, because uh, otherwise it, it's such hard work. It's such hard work to research. And, and if you don't love what you're doing, you're not going to go that extra mile. You're not going to search for more stuff. You're going to kind of uh, say, oh, this is enough. This is enough. It's going to be fine, which is not the purpose of research. Research is, can I get as much as possible information to contextualize and put everything in the mix and then present that to you. And you can only do that if you really have a passion for it and if you really love it. Um, you cannot be lazy. <laughs> if you're a lazy person, don't start doing research because it's going to be really then just, as I said, good enough. And I'm afraid good enough is not good enough. <laughs> Thank you. And then one of the challenges in entertainment industry is the use of substance abuse. Oh yeah. So what advice would you give the upcoming uh, entertainer? I don't. Firstly, I don't think it's just in the entertainment no, industry. No, it's not where, where, where because some... now I'm talking to you about entertainment. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's a societal issue, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I, I think it comes down from, uh, obviously, a, a, a lot of other psychological problems and, and societal problems, why that is happening. I, I, I'm not a psychologist and I don't know the human psyche that well, but what I do know is that you have to have other alleys to explore if you're, if something is forcing you to either drink too much or to use drugs or whatever substance you want to abuse or if it's uh, prescription drugs or whatever. So for me personally, working in that industry, I always felt that balance, you have to have balance. And that kind of goes in research, in life, anywhere. So if you are just focused on the entertainment industry and things are not going that well, then you are losing too much. But if you have a family or if you have a hobby or if you have something else that's also giving you balance so that everything is not just focused on, on that one thing, it, it kind of sits the same with, with research and with academics is if that is the only thing that, that you live for and suddenly 
the carpet gets pulled out under you, then, then what do you have to fall back on? And then maybe you're going to go and you say, well, let's drink a bit or let's um, use something else or smoke something. <laughs> um, so my advice would be balance. And balance also is to talk to people if you have troubles to look um, physically the better you look after yourself as well. I, I'm a big believer that you have to be fit and healthy because that also gives you the balance that you need. Um, but yeah, that is such a huge issue because I think it's also a lot to do with, with the psyche and, and that's not my field. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it covers uh, the, the mental health awareness. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. And then, apart from research, what are your other interests? Research is so consuming, all consuming when you are busy with a certain project that, that a lot of the other things kind of go. Um, uh, but again, almost linking to what I said earlier is the better you look after yourself in terms of your health and your fitness, the better researcher you are, because the longer you can actually work. Uh, it's it's weird to say, but the the more so so one of the things that I that I love doing and I, and I have a passion for is to to train, to to be really very very fit, and that helps me. I can work longer hours than like, that thing when when we shot Spruce, um I could go on until six o'clock. Where a lot of the younger people, kind of. Three o'clock, they, they're done for the evening and they, uh, and they're like, you know, they're like that Jerusalem, um, bunny, you know, they just kind of fall like that there. Um, so that links also with the more healthy you are and the more you look after yourself, the better you can, can do research. So I think that is kind of a, um, a passion. I love reading, obviously. Um, but again, when you are focused on a certain project, then you are, just kind of reading stuff that's feeding into it because you almost feel guilty to read a fictional book if you know that there's 10 other books that has something that's going to feed into your research. So I'm kind of finished with this project now. I'm between projects. So I'm going to try now during the university holiday to just read and run a lot and do some mountain biking and just get back, re almost reset, yes. and then we start again. Okay, thank you so much. And then, <clears throat> with reference to film practice, they talk about the pre-production, the mm. production, and the post-production. Can you take us through that uh, those processes? Oh yeah, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, we still have time. <laughs> no. Uh, so, so the pre-production part, uh, we in fact um, that that's the way I I scatter this. Uh, with the third year specifically, not with the postgrads, but with the with the third years, we work in the pre uh, and then the production and the post production. Pre production is the planning, the scheduling, um, the writing of the the screenplay or the script. Then the production obviously would be the sh the filming of it. The um, in a certain sense, also rehearsals, but rehearsals can be part of the pre production. But then the production would be mostly filming it, and um, then the, the post-production would be where we edit the stuff, uh, where where you then combine the sound and the visuals and you, you edit the whole project together. So in, in, the, in the film industry, there's different departments that cover those things. With my third years, we, we, we try to have them do everything. So they plan, they write, they then shoot, direct, act in it, and then they edit it at the end so that they get the whole, in, well, an, an oversight over what they can possibly do when they leave the university. Because within those three worlds, each student would identify something that they really feel a passion for. Um, uh, in, in one class, you could have a third of the class that wants to just edit because they love sitting there and just cutting together all of the little pictures. Some of the students only want to do directing because directing, you kind of have that con creative control. And then other students love writing the screenplay, doing the planning. Where do we shoot this scene? Where do we shoot that scene? 
So yeah, so that that's the world that I've I've worked in the production and the post production world my whole life. The pre production part I've worked in the writing with that soap opera when I directed the episodes I also helped developing the stories. But I the planning and the scheduling for me that's like math. It's really boring. I don't know I don't know <laughs> want to do that. Hey, thank you so much. And then Narrative inquiry and storytelling, mm. can they be used as the methodological approach in terms of uh, research practice? Absolutely. Um, we have at the university uh, a, a PhD in creative writing. So you can, and even the most basic academic writing still has to be quite creative. People need to be able to read and understand what you are writing. Um, I've ju I'm, I'm busy reading a book where, where th they talk about academic writing and the fact that it's very easy to confuse people in academic writing because you are so focused on your subject matter that you, are, you forget that somebody else needs to comprehend that. So in, in, in that sense, I think creative writing and, and narrative writing can help an academic to make their field of expertise more understandable, more readable, more accessible. Um, I've always had a thing in, in terms of theater writing where I said, it's very easy to confuse an audience with all of your issues and with um, such a lot of um, subtext that nobody actually understands what you're trying to say. Where, uh, and, and a lot of academics feel that they, they don't have to make it accessible because if you don't understand it, you're obviously not on, on their intellectual level, which is, which is a crime. Everybody needs to be able to read and enjoy even the most complex stuff. Yes. And in fact, I think the better you understand your subject, the better you can make it understandable for other people. So, yeah, no, the two worlds definitely come together. I, I think in certain academic fields, it's almost impossible to make it entertaining. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris, for sharing with us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It was lovely. Thank you.